Alrighty, welcome everyone to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to welcome our guest this week, Arnold Vandenberg, the CEO and Co-Chief Investment Officer of Century Management Financial Advisors. Arnold began his investing career in 1968 and founded Century Management in 1974. He has been featured on numerous media outlets and it is, it is our pleasure to feature him today on our live stream. For those of you out in the audience, um, I see a couple of you there in the chat already on top of things, uh, please do let us know where you are viewing from. We do love seeing those international audience members out there. And as always, please feel free to post those questions and comments for Arnold throughout the presentation, and we'll go ahead and jump into them once we get to the end of things today. Without anything further from me, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Arnold, and we can jump into it. Well, thank you very much, Graham. First of all, I would like to thank you, Graham, for the time you took in helping to select the material for this presentation. I know it wasn't easy wading through all the material, but it was really helpful for us to create a program, hopefully, that will be meaningful to your audience. Good morning. I should say good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to share our views. 20 years ago, I wrote an article and mentioned there are only three things important to understand with regard to investment, inflation, interest rates, the fundamentals of the business. The reason is because inflation affects interest rates, interest rates affect bond prices, inflation and interest rates affect the price you pay for a company, the price earnings ratio, which I'll discuss later. So it is a critical question. We are confronting a major problem we want to share with you. The problem is inflation. The question is, is inflation as transitory as Federal Reserve believes? We believe some of the inflation that is caused by COVID-19 is transitory. However, there are major forces that are not transitory and are actually inflationary. I'm going to name them now. One is the energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables. That's one. Number two a commodity bull market that is caused by shortages in critical material for renewable energy. And number two, the underinvestment of companies and investors in commodities in general. The third is US federal deficits and debt. And all of these are potentially causing a decline in the dollar. A decline in the dollar is the single most inflationary things that can happen to the U.S. economy. So we're going to review that now. Now, the question is, inflation is a transitory. In other words, is it temporary? We believe the recent increase in inflation stems from the impact of COVID relief. The combined COVID relief packages provide record monetary liquidity and fiscal stimulus which not only prevented what many predicted would be a depression, but also produced the shortest recession on record. The liquidity and stimulus check led to a recovery in demand more quickly than anticipated. However, tight COVID protocols, lockdown, social distancing, along with general stimulus checks, slowed employees returning to work. The resulting labor deficit relative demand caused disruptions throughout supply chains, Worldwide, this caused well-documented inventory and product shortages, as well as higher freight costs across nearly every industry. Inventories are now just above record low. See, see this slide that we're looking at now. Now, as you can see, one of the significant thing is over 30 years, we have the lowest inventory on record in the last 30 years which means, which I just explained why, is the thing that is causing inflationary pressures. And so low inventory causes people to bid up the commodity, and obviously that's inflationary. Now, the proof of this is to look at the Federal Reserve, their famous indicator, rather than the Consumer Price Index. And you can see that the inflation was running around 2%, a little less. And in the last year, it has broken out of a 25 year record. So basically what we're saying is the COVID was responsible for a lot of this and it caused shortage of material, which caused the breakout, 25 year breakout of inflation. Now, 
The question is, is this temporary or are there other forces at work that would create inflation? As labor, re as labor returns, supply chains should normalize. Additionally, as the recent above trend growth rates moderate, it should allow inventories to rebuild, eliminating the COVID related shortages. As shortages dissipate, we believe some of the recent inflationary pressure will prove to be temporary, though taking longer than the Fed has expected. The Delta variant will certainly continue playing the role on the pace of normalization. So getting back to the question, is inflation temporary? Based on the COVID, there are some things that are temporary. There are, however, other major long-term trends which have an inflationary implications that may not prove to be as temporary as the Federal Reserve expects. The numbers that we're gonna relate is, the first thing is the energy transition and the related commodity bull market, that's one. Number two, the US federal deficit, and then the commodity bull market, which is caused by shortages in all raw material. And then of course, the direction of the US dollars. Offsetting that is the good news is the digital revolution, which has historically been a huge driver of productivity, is offsetting these inflationary pressure. We'll review this in the next few slides. The reason we feel that the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is a wonderful thing that needs to be done over the long run because we're gonna run out of fossil fuels eventually. But the main reason that everybody's excited about it because obviously it helps with climate change. The electrification of power and transportation markets using renewable sources require a massive investment in solar panels, windmills, batteries, hydrogen, and more. It also requires a huge investment in charging station and a greatly expanded secure and reliable power grid. The energy transition is a complete reorientation of the world's power and transportation markets. What took a century to build is now envisioned to be rebuilt over the next two decades. The transition will create, require an enormous demand on commodities, which we'll get into later. While we understand the need to eliminate CO2 emissions, it will not be easy, quick, or cheap. Let me give you an example of the major problems in going to renewable energy. In addition to the cost is our supply chain that will supply us with all critical materials. This is one of the big problems in renewable energy. Unfortunately, they come from less reliable countries. For example, cobalt, which is an integral part of renewable energy, critical element for batteries, major suppliers are the Democratic Republic of Congo, Russia, and Australia. Copper, an intricate part of the industrial society as well as electrical, comes from Chile, Peru, and China. Graphite, China, Mozambique, and Brazil. Uh, nickel, Indonesia, Philippines, and Russia. All the other countries listed on this chart are the countries that are gonna be the major suppliers of these materials for the renewable energy. Now keep in mind that we were energy independent last year, which means we only had to rely on foreign suppliers for other materials, uh, none of these materials in a big way. But now that we are switching to fossil fuel, from fossil fuels to renewable, we're gonna to have to rely on these countries. I'm sure you all agree if you examine it, most of us would not wanna live in these countries, let alone depend on our supply to keep our energy going. So this is a major thing. On point three here, I say China accounts for more than half of worldwide production of many critical rare earth materials, which are absolutely vital for renewable energy. So we are going to have to depend on China and a few other countries that we would not want to do considering that China is considered an enemy as well as a supplier and hardly one we would want to depend on. 
Many countries are in danger of natural disasters, military coups, trade risk, making supply chains difficult to establish and vulnerable to disruption. Let me give you a classic example. This is not our opinion. This is an opinion of the Finland study of geographical society. They are a, an organization that is very large and big on renewable energy. And they made a study, it was 500 pages, and they gave an example and here's what they're saying. Their conclusion was that there is no way that with the current inventories and production capabilities that the world is ready to switch over the next 10 or 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever number you want to use to renewable energy. And here's why. Take a look at cobalt. Global production is in 218 was 140,000 tons. If you wanted to replace the complete fleet of cars, 216 numbers, you would need 121 million tons of cobalt. Based on, based on the production this year, it would take 866 years to produce that amount of cobalt. Now, we agree that we're not going to change from internal combustion to, to electric cars in the next year. But this is even over a 20-year period. That's a pretty big demand. Lithium, same thing, 85,000, needed 45 million. 538 years. Nickel, 53 years, and copper, nine years. Now, let me show you why this is so critical to understand why this is not possible to do in any of the next 10 years. The reason is that in order to create a new mine in any of these things, like take copper, it takes at least nine to 15 years to get everything going to be able to produce co more copper. That means that if we have to increase it by nine times, it takes nine years just to be able to produce a new mine. Now, let me give you some other examples of how other people feel about this. Here's from the Finland Geological Survey. Their conclusion that there's going to be major shortages of critical commodities. A Dutch government sponsored study who are very big in renewables concluded that the Netherlands green ambition alone, just the Netherlands, 18 million people alone would consume a major share of global minerals. Exponential growth in renewable energy production capacity the study noted is not possible with present day technologies and annual metal production. That's an independent view. Here's the IEA. At least 30 times as much lithium, nickel, and other key materials may be required by the electrical car industry by 2040 to meet global climate goals. This is the International Energy Agency. The price of eliminating CO2 will likely be higher cost of energy for consumers and can be seen in those countries that have transitioned to renewables the quickest. For example, Germany, Denmark, and Britain have seen average electricity rates rise 60 to 110 percent over the last two decades. So the bottom line of it is, as you look at this, the idea that we're going to have electrical cars in the next 10 to 20 years replaced the internal combustion engine is not realistic, not because it's not possible, but because the minerals are in such short supply, number one, and number two, it takes so long to bring on new production. It isn't like just putting a new computer software program in. It's a huge situation. Now, let me just give you two examples out of today's newspaper. Here is a commodity where Chinese magnesium shortens, threatens global car industry. Let me just read you the first paragraph. The world's largest comet, car makers could face a potential cripple, crippling shortage of aluminum as Chinese power crisis threatens supply of key components used to make lightweight metal. 
Magnesium is an essential raw material for the production of alumni alloys, which are used in everything from gearboxes, steering columns, seat frames, and fuel tank cover. Owing to production curbs in China, which is a near monopoly on magnesium. Now just think about that. China has a monopoly on a key thing that makes aluminum. Uh, stockpiles at the company metal are running dangerously low across Europe. These are no subs, there is no substitute for magnesium in aluminum production. 35% of downstream demand for magnesium is auto sheets. So if magnesium supply stops, the entire industry will potentially be forced to stop. Now this article is on the website. Graham said that he would uh, produce that for you. I haven't got time to go into the great detail, but to give you examples. Here is another great example. This is from Trading Economics, a huge company that monitors all of the countries in the world on supply situation. Copper futures rose 470 per pound, getting closer to a record high of 490 in May. On the back of a weaker dollar, shrinking global inventory levels as historically high energy prices hurt production. The copper market London Metal Exchange spot prices are trading over a larger premium than they have in the, in years since 1994. So we're talking 26 to 27 years. Meanwhile, and this is critical, freely available stockpiles have shrunk by more than 90% over the last couple of months and sit near multi-decades low. Uh, the London Metal Exchange monitored warehouse, a trend also seen in Chinese and American inventories. Now, just think about that. 90% reduction in just a few months. Adding to concerns, a Peruvian community will block a key road in a major copper mine in Peru, the world's second largest producer, after failed negotiation with the government. Let me say another thing about these unreliable countries that are gonna be suppliers to us. Not only do they have freedom to do whatever they wanna do, they can confiscate a mine, they can raise taxes, they can create different uh, uh, regulations to make it difficult. So anything that steps in the way obviously is going to create that. Now I would invite you to look at all the commodities and take a look at their supply and demand and what is going on. And you'll see a common trend across 20 commodities. Very few of them are in good shape. And the reason is that the underinvestment in commodities has created this. And I wanna make one point, even though we're talking about this being an inflationary trend, the commodity bull market that we're talking about, which is already a year and a half old, and we believe based on some normal guesses on the length of bull markets and the shortage and so forth, we think it'll probably last seven years, seven to eight years, uh, based on a couple of things. Number one, the last bull market in commodities in the 70s, which created the inflation, was about seven to eight years. But more importantly, a much better gauge is to say, okay, there's going to be a shortage because there's underinvestment in commodities. Now, the real key is, what is it going to take to create more production? And since we know that the average mine to create it is nine to 15 years, we know that you can't bring on a lot of supply in the next couple of years, which means there will be a shortage of those commodities and obviously, we all know that if there's shortages, there's going to be price increases. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you is how critical it is to understand that when we are on fossil fuels, take a look at natural gas. Solar wind today requires six to 12 times more mineral resources than an equivalent gas plant. So you look at the price of electric cars. These are all the things you're going to need in an electric car. Look at the conventional car. Now look at offshore wind. These are all the commodities needed. Onshore wind, solar uh, panels, nuclear energy, coal, and natural gas. So fossil fuels 
have been the dominant energy provider because they are more dense, need less other commodities, and we are naturally, we were almost energy independent. So eliminating CO2 emission by switch shifting from high energy density fossil fuels to lower energy density requires a significant increase in metal, mineral content per unit of energy. During the transition, mining process and transporting these fuels will require significant energy, primarily gasoline, diesel, and natural gas. The price of eliminating CO2 will likely be a higher cost of energy for consumers, as can be seen in those countries that have transitioned to renewables. Now let's talk about the commodity bull market. Let me state again that this commodity bull market is not based on inflation, it's based on underinvestment in commodities. In other words, when you don't invest in a production capacity and exploration situations, you're eventually going to get short. Why did this happen? First of all, the commodity markets companies, the companies that invest in commodities are usually very poor investment. They're highly leveraged. They have low return on capital. They need a lot of capital adventures, capital, uh, capital expenditures. And so they're not necessarily the kind of companies you'd want to invest in over the long run. In the last 10 years, they have been particularly poor performance because of the fact that nobody wanted to invest in these ideas, because of the fact that we had a bull market and stock market and everything else. The commodity market did, was dismal over the last 10 years. There was no ex, uh, reduction in exploration and production. So they're actually getting to the point where the price went down. Nobody wanted to invest in it. And so now for the past 10 years, while everybody's looking the other way, the commodity companies have had huge problems. And so I'm going to give you an example of what happened in previous major shortages in bull markets and commodities due to these similar things, which was in 70 to 80. So while I do believe that the commodity market bull market is independent of stocks in general and is independent of inflation, the fact that it's in a bull market and all these commodities are going to go up in price is the thing that will help fuel the inflation. In other words, it's not the, it's not the bull market. It's not going to go up because we have inflation. It's going to go up because we have shortages and we have a greater demand. So let's take a look at what happened in the 70s, 1972 to 80. One of the main things that I'm trying to point this out to investors is that not only is there a lot of money to be made in this commodity bull market, which has been in existence for a year and a half, is that it's also a great hedge against other portfolio positions you may have. For example, in 1972 to 80, inflation, inflation common stocks declined 48% from 72 to 40. In other words, in two years, at the same time, commodity markets, stocks that were invested in commodity markets went up 100%. So while the market went down 48%, the commodities went up 100% at the same time. So obviously having a commitment to things such as this will help protect your portfolio because as I'm gonna show you in, in, later on in the slides, the most critical thing to understand, as I pointed out earlier, is that you have to understand inflation because it drives price earnings ratio, interest rates, et cetera. So here's an example of oil. We're starting off at the top of the bull, uh, at the top of the bull market in 72, been going up for 20 years. Inflation started up and oil went from 259 to 1165 in the first few years. Then it went sideways, it went up to 1366. The bottom line is it ended up at $34, which is the 38% per year, not over the total period, but per year, which is incredible because during the same time, the S&P only averaged 2% and had a 48% decline in the first two years. Take a look at gold. 
Same thing, $45 to 183, almost 322%, while the market went down 48. The ultimate uh, return was 36% per year. So obviously a little bit of this into a regular portfolio could certainly help hedge the portfolio. Silver, it went spectacular. Part of it was artificial because of the Hunts brothers tried to corner the market, which was ridiculous. But if I use the average price instead of the 49, it still averaged 38% per year. Copper, which we have been talking about is in short supply is gonna be a major, major one in the bull market. I look at copper as the new gold. It is going to be a huge percentage gainer. I think much greater than it was in the past. But anyway, it averaged 14% over the same period. Let's take a look at an index of equal weight commodities. I tried to figure out a way to show what an average portfolio looked like if it was diversified across many commodities. So I chose an equally unweighted commodities. If you have 21 commodities, you put $1,000 in each, this is what they return. They returned an average of 20% diversified into an equally weighted portfolio. So it's safe to say that during the market that only went up 2%. Now here is the stock market, the S&P, same peak where it was there, we're showing it across that period, and it averaged 17% or 2% a year. So during the time that all the commodity companies, and I'm not speaking about a commodity futures, I'm talking about investing in companies that either one actually do the production or are services that could be connected with the stock market. In other words, let's say you have a copper company, you can invest in companies that provide uh, services, any kind of services. They all need specialized services. The companies who specialize in that. And if you don't want the risk of a cyclical company like a copper company, you can find many companies. I define that as the pick and shovel idea. That if there's a gold mine, you don't necessarily need to go mining for gold. You could sell the picks and shovels and make and do very well. Most of the time, do better than the gold miners. The other thing is that there's many services in there. So I'm trying to direct your attention from companies who are very, very, the sentiment is very negative on them. Uh, they're always considered a poor investment, but there are times at the right price, and I want to emphasize that as a value investor, price determines your return. Quality companies always are the best ones to invest in unless they're overpriced. And mediocre companies and questionable companies can be extraordinary investor if you bought them at the right price and to a certain extent when the industry starting to come alive. Now, the next chart I want to show you is very educational. I spent a lot of time putting this together from the old uh, statistics in the 70 bull market. Now, you can see it's 72 January through December. The CPI averaged about 3.2%. We get into 73 and you can see the commodity price or the CPI starting to go up. In January, 3.65, in April, 5%. By August, it was 738. And by December, it was 871. In one year, one year, the CPI went from 365 to 871. Now the core inflation, which everybody likes to use because it eliminates food and energy. I don't know anybody who can get along without food and energy, but this is the way they play the game. And so you can see the core inflation did not go up that much considering the CPI because they eliminate the two biggest things, energy and food. Now let's take a look at the price. If you look at the S&P, it was at 116 at that time. The PE was at the peak was 19 and 72, but it went to 18.9. So at the beginning of the inflation, the PE was around 18 to 19. As the inflation picked up, look what happened to the S&P. Went down to 16.8, 10% decline in PE. 
7.38, it went down to 15, 19% decline. December 871, it went down to 13.7, which is a 26% return. Now, here's the thing that is amazing about the stock market. Well, everybody was talking about the this inflation wasn't so bad because look at the core PE. The market smelled it. And the reason is analysts are looking at the profit margins and so on and so forth. So the inflation shows up quicker in the stock market than in the bond market. And so that's an important thing to do. Don't watch the core CPI. That's not your indication. Use the CPI and look what happens to the multiple. Now we get into 74. The inflation goes to 939. The PE goes to 12 in April, 11.8. And by the time we get to the peak inflation, the multiple went to 7.7. So you have a multiple of 19 going to 7.7 in this extreme example of inflation. The thing I want to point to you is the market that I have observed over the last 50 years is that the market really starts to get concerned when you have inflation over three and a half to 4% that people perceive to be more persistent. The reason the market is not pricing inflation today because everybody thinks it's transitory or temporary. If that is the case, then the market could continue to hang in there, not necessarily have great gains, but hang in there. However, if this proves to be more than temporary and gets to be persistent, and gets to be believed that it's gonna be 4% and over, I can guarantee you these decreases in PE. Now, there are some high inflation, high multiple stocks, and I have no question that they're wonderful companies, they have great growth rates, et cetera, et cetera. But they're going to get their multiples cut when the inflation starts to take in and here's a good example of the ratios that can happen. Now, let's look now at the third reason for the potential inflationary pressure. And that is the US debt and budget deficits. Now, let me say one thing about the presentation here. There are a lot of people that I respect, brilliant people, money managers, some economists, that really believe that we are, because of the high debt, that we are in a deflationary period like Japan. Japan has had four uh, recessions in the time that we only had one. So obviously there's a great argument, the fact that when there's too much debt, there's many academic studies, and you can look at all the different countries that have had high debt, and you can see that the economy really slows down because the debt service becomes a bigger part of the cost. And obviously, if your costs go up, your profits go down, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go into a recession. Our belief is that this inflation is not temporary or transitory, but it can be very volatile. For example, if we go into a recession because of the high debt and the slowing of the economy, obviously the inflation is gonna go down for a while. But as I'm gonna show you, there is no way that this government can pay off the debt by growing the economy or cutting costs. I'm gonna show you that later. So the only way long-term to pay off this debt, which is now 125% of GDP, the highest in the history of this country, including the Second World War, there's no way to pay this off. So while we could argue that you have a recession first and a little bump up and maybe another recession, things like in Japan, we are not like Japan. Japan is very unique in that they don't have a bond market. The government finances all the debt, so they don't have the risk of the bond market vigilantes turning against them. But let's take a look at the facts here. Here we show the budget deficits. First year, 216, 3 trillion in revenues, 3.8 in outlays, you have a deficit on the right-hand column at 584. Go to 217, 665, 218, 779, 219, almost a trillion. Here's the key. This is unbelievable. In 220, 2020, I'm sorry, we had a $3 trillion deficit. And we know why, because of COVID, 
because of COVID-19, because all of the government programs to fund this, to keep us out of a recession. And I'm not arguing the fact that that shouldn't have been done, but that's what happened. The next year, which is 221, we're in the year now, we're gonna have close to a $3 trillion deficit again. Maybe it's 2.8 at its best, but let's take 3 trillion. Then in 2022, we're hopefully getting back to normal, which is a $1 trillion deficit. Now, think about this. We had 3 trillion in 2020, 3 trillion in 2021, that's 6 trillion, 1 trillion estimated. And let me just say one thing. The government budget office estimates that the, uh, that the uh, interest cost is not gonna go over 3%. It's about one and a half percent now. Now, if you believe that inflation is gonna go on for 10 years, there's no way you're gonna have a bond rate of 3%. Matter of fact, in 2007, we had an interest cost of 5%. If we have, if we just go to 5%, and it could go much higher, we would add another 50% to the budget deficit, which means we'd have a, mil, a trillion six. So the important thing to understand is that in the last three years, one going forward, we've had $7 trillion of debt. Now, let me say one thing. In all of this insanity, it is hard to believe that the country has already proved another trillion dollars and is negotiating from six trillion to three and a half trillion, which is really about five trillion. I think they're getting it down to the two trillion dollars. So let's say that they're going to add another trillion and maybe another trillion and a half to two trillion dollars. That's another three trillion on top of this. Now, let's go to the next slide, which will show us the total debt. Now, this is truly an extraordinary thing. Every American of every stripe ought to really study this and understand what is happening to this country. Let me give you an example. They started keeping the budget in the turn of the century, 1900. So I ran the statistics from 1900 to 205, just to see what the last 15 years brought. So up until from 1900 to 205, we had a seven trillion plus deficit. That means in 105 years, we created $7 trillion of debt. Now, if you go back to the previous slide, you'll see that we had 3 trillion in 2020, 3 trillion 21 and a trillion uh, and a half or a trillion one. So we created $7 trillion in the last three years. Whereas before that, it took 105 years to create $7 trillion, and that included two world wars plus the other wars. Now think about that. In three years, we created as much debt as we did in 105 years. And just to show that it doesn't stop, in the last five years, ending in 2006 to 11, we added 4.7 trillion. That's almost 50% of what we took 105 years to do, that got us up to 1231, 12 trillion. The next five years, we added another 5.79 trillion, got us up to 18 trillion. Now through August 21, we added 9.6 trillion, which is more than 105 years, and we're at the 27 trillion. We're actually over 28 trillion right now. Now what this shows, is that we compounded our debt at 9%. Wouldn't it be great if we can compound the economy at 9%, not the debt? Now, currently, the total United States debt to GDP, which is a measure against all other countries, is 125%. There are many studies, empirical and academic, that show that once the economy goes over 80%, you're gonna have a major effect in a slowing in the economy. And this is what creates stagflation. When you have inflation and slow economy, you slow everything down and increase the cost of doing business and lower margins. Now, to sum it up over the last 15 years, 
The United States has increased 2.65%, 9% compounded. If there's no change, the debt is compounding at a rate that could cause us to double in roughly eight years. That means if we don't do something, we're going to have 54 trillion in debt against an economy that's much less, and that is just not sustainable. The numbers of I want to emphasize again, the numbers do not include the trillion dollars or the two, two point trillion, 3.5 that they're negotiating. As the debt deficit increased, it could cause a lack of confidence and therefore a decline in the US dollars. I don't need to emphasize to you that a decline in the dollar is highly inflationary, especially since we're going to have to import all these rare critical commodities that are necessary for the renewable situation. So a decline in the dollar is very significant. Now, let me just sum up this major key. The thing I wanna emphasize is I'm not recommending buying commodity futures. That's not something that we would be involved in nor recommend unless you're a commodity trader. In 1998, the Richmond Fed made a study of the inflationary uh, of the 70s, which was the worst inflation in modern history. So the Fed took the idea that let's see what happened in the 70s so we can avoid it. Arthur Burns was the Fed chairman at the time, and he was considered the top person practically in the world as an expert on economic cycle. The most important thing to understand about Arthur Burns is that he was an inflation hawk. He was death against inflation. He knew that all the problems from inflation would be a major problem for any country, including the United States. He did everything he could to make sure that we didn't get inflation. Yet he presided, this is an amazing story. He presided over the worst inflation in modern history. And when he retired, he made a speech and it called the anguish of central banking. In other words, this was kind of a confession about what happened and what caused the inflation. And his speech is so important to understand this, that this was done 45 years ago, but it applies to today and it applies even more today than ever. And I wish that every congressperson, whatever their stripes, would really sit down and read these few paragraphs because if they truly read it and believed it and acted on their conscience, there is no way they could be talking about these trillion dollar deficit programs. But let me read it to you. This is verbatim. Once it was established that the key function of government was to solve problems and relieve hardships, not only for society at large, but also for troubled industry, regions, occupation, or social group, a great and growing body of problems and hardship became candidates for government solution. How's that sound with today's program? The government program cumulative effect was to impart a strong inflationary bias to the American economy. The pursuit of costly social reforms often went hand in hand with the pursuit of full employment. The weighing of the scales of government policy inevitably gave an inflationary twist to the economy, and so did the expanding role of government regulations. My conclusion, and I'm quoting Arthur Burns, that it is illusory to expect central banks to put an end to inflation that now afflicts the industrial commodities does not mean that central banks are incapable of stabilizing action. In other words, he made the statement that it's illusory to expect the central banks to do anything about inflation doesn't mean that they can't. Here's the key. It simply means that their practical capacity for curbing an inflation that is driven by political forces is very limited. And let me just reiterate this. The problem in today's economies are far worse from an inflationary standpoint than they were in the 70s for two reasons. Number one, the debt to GDP was 34% instead of 125%, which means they had a lot of room to create some money. Number two, the mandatory co uh, cost of running the government was a small, it was 
equal to the discretionary cost. So that means they had a lot to cut. Today, the mandatory expenses are two, two times that of the discretionary. So basically, there's not much room to cut. Now, let me just give you the history, which we did from 1900. And in all the budget surpluses, we had $616 billion of surpluses over 105 years. But the deficits with the, this year's uh, number turned out to be 21 trillion. So even in the best of years, we only created $600 billion surplus where we created $21 trillion of deficit. And to think that this is going to change is really illusory. So basically, the government is going to continue to create the deficit. And the big problem is paying the debt off. Now, there is one thing that I would like to mention, and that is very important. And there's very sophisticated people, good money manager on this side. And what they're saying is that a lot of this inflation will be neutralized by the div di digital revolution. And I'll just read you page the number on four. As digitization continues to push forward with cloud computing, artificial intelligence, supercomputing, the Internet of Things, robotics, 5Gs, electrical vehicle, atomic vehicle, virtual reality, precision farming, and more, we see technology continue to produce large productivity, say, that offset inflationary pressure. So there's many sides of the story, and we want to point out that the good news about inflation is the fact that there are things offsetting it. One of the things is the high debt. The other one is the digital revolution. And that is a big part of productivity. So we're hoping that that will help uh, that, but we don't think it's going to cover it all. Now, let me just give you some examples of uh, what we might recommend, OK? Uh, we believe part of the portfolio should be allocated to stocks or funds that invest in commodities, not the future contract, but the actual operating companies. As for the investment allocation in the commodities, this will depend on a personal circumstances. So it's best to discuss it with your advisor. If you are not capable of being an analyst in commodity type companies, then we would recommend that you use ETFs because you have a broad spectrum of things. Also, we would like to direct your attention towards the opportunities related to increases in commodity prices, which will likely create opportunities in companies to provide services and advise these commodities. So we would like to make everybody who's in the stock market aware that there's going to be enormous opportunities. It could be in the operating companies, but new companies will create or new companies will go into bull markets because they service these kind of companies and they could be very good companies with moats and everything else. So it's a worthwhile area to explore whether you want to invest in the commodity companies or not. Now, uh, basically, the principle is if there's a gold rush, don't go mining for gold, sell picks and shovels. So there's a lot of ways to play this game and may, being aware of what's going on would help you to find companies that suit your situation. We would like to take a few minutes to give you some example. And we have one company that is actually our favorite. We've been in this company. It's gone up quite a bit, but it's got a lot of room to do. And it is Pioneer Natural Resource. This is the classical situation where you have a terrible industry with a wonderful company. Now, let me give you some ideas. First of all, it's the largest producer of oil and gas in the Permian with 15,000 plus tier one drilling locations on a contiguous private acreage. Tier one means it's the superior companies to produce the most oil out of any particular acreage. There's three tiers. The first tier is the most profitable, and after that, it's all downhill. It has one of the lowest cost structure with break-even levels of oil near $28 per barrel. That means after $28, we're at 75 to 80 now. It's all profit. Highly efficient operation allow for five production, production goals while generating substantial free cash flow. Maintains one of the strongest balance sheets in the industry with net debt 
to EBITDA of just 0.75 and heading towards 0.50. That is about as good as it gets to balance sheets. We believe it's a great value. The Pioneer management team is focused on generating high levels of free cash and returning 80% of free cash to shareholders in the form of a newly established place, variable dividend. We don't have time to go into it, but the variable dividend is a unique feature to these companies. And what basically they're saying is, we're gonna take 80% of the free cash flow we do, and we're gonna give it into a dividend. So if the free cash goes up, the dividend goes up. Between 20 to 26, based on WTI futures priced at an average price of 58, VXD should produce more than 90 per share in cumulative free cash flow and a payout of 74 per share in cumulative dividends, equal to 40% of the current stock price at 921. I'm sorry, at 191. For 22, based on the next 12 months, WTI futures should generate approximately 25 per share in free cash flow pay out of 80% or approximately 20 per share in total annual dividend. Today's stock price at 191, it's selling at seven point next five, next 12 months free cash flow and a 10% dividend yield. Now, go through the history of oil companies, very rarely do they ever talk about free cash flow. The multiple's always cash flow. This is 7.5% of free cash flow. Now let's look at a chart that we made and what we're saying is, here's an easy way to tell what they're going to pay you as a dividend. At $50 oil, which is worth at 6% dividend, the stock is probably priced right at 191, 193. So at $50 oil, if you believe long-term in $50 oil, you're going to get a 6% free cash flow yield. But if oil goes to, it's at 80, but if oil goes to 55, you earn 233% at a 6% cash flow. If oil goes to 271 uh, at $60, it's 271. And if it goes to 70, it goes to 349. If it goes to 75, which it's already at, it's 388. So obviously you can see that if you wanted an 8% cash flow, you could pay $75 at $60, two or three and so on. If you wanted 14% free cash flow, then you could only pay $100 for the stock. So this is a simple matrix because of the fact that 80% of the cash flow is going to go on to the dividend. Now, to sum it up, we recommend that you look at these areas. If you're not an analyst in, in, in these individuals, you can buy the ETF. If you want a gas and oil expiration, there's the XOP, Energy Select is XLE, uh, Oil Service is OIH. Uh, natural gas is FCG, global uranium, Vanek gold miners. There's all kinds of different ways to play it. And you just have to make sure that when you buy these ETFs, that you have a methodology to price them at the right price, because in bull markets and commodities, you have huge swings. And so I recommend that the bull markets a year and a half old, they've had some huge gains. So I would start with a small position average in, make sure that you buy it at a point that it represents value. As far as a single mutual fund, if I had to pick one mutual fund that specializes in the commodity market, there's only one that I can feel good about recommending. Not that there aren't any others, I just don't know them that well. But Goering and Rosen Research Fund, GRHIX, is a wonderful mutual fund. We have invested our clients into their fund. They have a complete program for uh, investing in commodities. They've had 30 years experience. They're a wonderful group. I really believe in them. And if anybody wanted just one source to make it easy, I would recommend that fund. In closing, I would like to state this. We know that higher levels of inflation are so associated with lower P multiples. With the stock market selling at historically high PEs, we believe it's very important to assess the longer term direction and the temporary nature of recent rise in inflation. While the majority of recent inflationary pressure is likely to be temporary, we believe there remains a potential for long term inflationary pressure as the world pursues a transition to renewable energy and key critical commodity experience significant supply demand. 
At the same time, we recognize the powerful productivity gains that relentless adoption of technology unleashes. This closes our program. And if there's any of you who may have some questions and we have time to answer questions, I'll leave that up to Graham. Uh, I'll be happy to try to answer some of those. All right. Well, thank you, Arnold, so much for taking us through that wonderful presentation. Absolutely illuminating for the audience out there. Uh, tons of appreciation in the chat already for that great presentation. We do have a couple of questions lined up, and I'm sure more will roll in as well. Let me scroll back up to the top of our list. Question here from Brian. Uh, I got it in right at the beginning of the presentation before we even jumped into things. He was hoping to know uh, what you think of investing in biotechnology companies in general, um, companies that do things like genetic editing companies and whatnot. Uh, his specific example here is Kathy Woods, Arc G, uh, just to toss one out there. Well, I would say that I'm the wrong person to give any opinion on that because I have no knowledge in it. However, as a general person who's very interested in health, and that's another story, uh, I am very familiar with all of the things that are going on in that field. And I would say if you can find somebody that understands the field and is able to evaluate those companies, I think it would be an enormous field to invest in. And I would personally want to do that if I felt I had the expertise. Unfortunately, that's not an area that I do have. So I would recommend investing in it, getting somebody who really knows that field, which there are many, and that would be a great place to invest because irrespective of inflation or economic problems, when people have health problems, they gotta pay the price. And as Buddha said, health is the greatest gift. So anything that enhances health is gonna be a good investment. Absolutely. And continuing uh, down our list, uh, getting through a lot of hellos from all over the world. Uh, looks like we have people from Spain, Puerto Rico, a bunch of other countries joining us. So welcome to all of you international audience members once again. And we do appreciate you taking the time out of day uh, to go ahead and join us. Looks like next question on our list, once again from Brian, uh, asking, uh, at this point in time, uh, in short, um, is the market too overpriced for somebody to get into it, or are there options out there for, for somebody to start investing right now? Well, that is an excellent question, and that is on the mind of everybody in the market and not in the market. And I would say that the market is probably, it's certainly not cheap, uh, but it wouldn't be extremely expensive as long as interest rates stay at this level because let me give you a perspective on interest rates. This is the lowest interest rates we've had in over a hundred years. So obviously if the interest rates are low, the P multiples are higher. And so if the inflation and the interest rates stay low, then you're probably okay. But if the inflation and interest rates move up and the interest rates move up, then the multiples go down as I showed you on that chart. So that's the one consideration. So to answer your question directly, it's not overpriced if the inflation and interest stay down, but it is if the inflation comes up. Now, there are opportunities, and there are opportunities in technology. And, you know, like we talked about the digital revolution, this is earth shaking, and there's going to be opportunities in there that may not be right today or tomorrow, but I'd be looking for that. The other thing you want to do, and I forgot to mention that, is the most important thing to invest in in companies are the companies who have pricing power. In other words, a company that could raise the price if the inflation goes up, because there's some companies that can't raise the price, and if the price can't raise and they have to pay extra costs, the margins go down, the earnings collapse, and the stock will do so. So the big risk in this market is you want to have companies with pricing power and has a growth rate greater than the inflation. And if you buy it at a reasonable price, I think it would be a great opportunity. I also would recommend that this investor look into commodity markets, uh, not in bullion or anything else, or I'm sorry, not in uh, futures, but in areas where there's opportunity. So there's always opportunities. I would keep a large cash reserve and dollar cost average in. 
We don't have the time to go into dollar cost averaging, but it's my favorite concept. And that basically, if you really believe what you're buying and it has long-term future, you start with a little bit and average in. And that would be a great way to start. I certainly wouldn't go overboard right now. Understood. And looks like second kind of part of the question here, hey, we've, we've hit it a little bit, um, but do you think that because we're at you know such high valuations in some cases that we could be seeing this certain uh, correction coming in the future, not necessarily a crash, but big heavy-handed correction? And you mentioned holding on to cash. Would that be your recommendation to be prepared for it just in case? I would say I'm oh I've always been a believer in having cash position. Not because I'm worried about a crash or anything else, but because there's always opportunities if you got the cash. If you're always fully invested and now you see a company that is a great opportunity, if the market's going down, your stock may be going down and so you have to sell your stock at a lower price to buy the bargain. Whereas if you have the cash, you don't lose the money and now you could buy and make up the difference. So my theory in portfolio management is I always like to have cash, not because I'm hedging against the market decline, but I'm looking at thousands of stocks and once in a while you get into something that really gets hit for maybe some political reason or economic reason, but long term it's a buy. This gives you the opportunity to buy. I think in this environment, I would be very careful. Make sure that you're buying companies with great balance sheets. That's the single most important thing I would say in this market, because the market, if it starts to decline, penalizes those leveraged companies. So I want to make sure that it has a great balance sheet. I want to make sure that it has pricing power so it can pay off. Uh, it can increase the price of your service and not lose your margins. So that's the kind of company. Now, I want to give something John Templeton, before he died, wrote to his family. Uh, obviously, everybody knows who John Templeton is, one of the great investors, international investor. And he said, I believe, and this was written in 205, we wrote a similar program in 204. It was 65 pages, and we felt the prosperity of the world was going to peak out. I thought it would be 30 years. It actually turned out to be 15 years. But Templeton stated that even though he felt the world was over debted and prosperity was going to be under pressure, which means inflation, he felt one of the single best ways to hedge yourself in an inflationary environment is to buy co great companies who had pricing power and had the ability to grow, even though economic pressures were there. And that's a unique group of companies. So my philosophy is and the way we've uh, managed our portfolio we have companies that will prosper in any environment. They good, great companies with moats, the, the Buffett type of company, although they might be smaller, but they have pricing power. So if you're in a recession, they can still pick up prices. The other one is the commodity type companies who are going to benefit from the commodity bull market, not inflation, but commodity bull market. And then we have a mix of both. So we are not one way where we say there's going to be inflation and everything's inflation. If the inflation doesn't come, it could be postponed for five years. Then you wouldn't do very well. So it's a mix of companies to give you a balance. And that's what you need today is you need to be balanced because there are so many uncertainties. Never in the 50 years that I've been in this business have there been as many uncertainty, not even in 74, because in 74, we had great balance sheets in the government, 34% versus 125%. We had many opportunities. And then came along Volcker, who came out. And when I heard him speak, he's standing at 6'4", he's got a cigar in his mouth. He says, those of you who bet against me and that I'm not going to be able to curb inflation are going to lose. And the way he said that, I believed him. And boy, he did what needed to be done, which no politician would do today. And that is he raised the interest rates. They went up to 21%, caused one of the world's worst recession, but it stopped inflation and it gave us 25 to 30 years of prosperity. This guy is not only a great American, he's a saint, because he what, what he did for the American people 
is something that very few people can do. So that's the answer. Absolutely. And perfect segue here to our next question from Frank Arnold. Uh, he's asking, what is the probability that we could see a situation like that today where the Fed raises rates when they see that inflation may not be as, as transitory as some are saying it is? Can you repeat that again? I didn't quite get that. Absolutely. So continuing on from that point you were just making there, uh, of the Fed raising rates and you know, reigning in inflation. Is that something that we could see today? Um, should this current inflation that we're seeing not be transitory? I would say, like Arthur Burns said, it isn't that it's illusory that the central banks can't stop inflation. It's just not politically expedient. Let's take a look at the fact that Mr. Powell, uh, takes the approach that it's important to curb inflation. He stops the buying of the debt, which is propping up the bond market. He's agreed to start doing that, but in a very modest level. And let's say that he decides, oh boy, uh, we're gonna have more inflation than I anticipated, so I'm gonna keep raising the rates and I'm gonna quit buying the bonds and so forth. What that would immediately do is tank the market 15 to 20, 25%. At that point, you have everybody howling, somebody's hurting one way or another, and instead of taking the Volcker approach saying, look, you took your bets, you paid the price, everybody's got to suck it up, and we're going to get this inflation down. I don't think there's anybody today, in today's political environment, that either has the guts to do it, or if he did, he'd be kicked out soon. So I think the Fed is in a box. I wouldn't want to be a Fed official for any tea in China because they're in a box. I've been saying this for five years, even longer. And I just don't think there's a way out unless you take the hard nose approach to where you're going to solve the problem. The first thing you do is tell Congress to quit this insanity of creating another three or four trillion dollars worth of debt because the interest cost today is 400, somewhere between 350 and 400 billion dollars to pay the cost. If the interest rates go up two or three percent, that means it's two or three times the four billion dollars. That means you have a trillion dollars in interest costs along with the normal deficit. So you'd have two trillion dollars of deficit every year. There's no way this economy can support that. So it's a very, very difficult position. I think the Fed's going to keep going back and forth, back and forth, maybe even cause a recession. But then when to get out of the recession, what are you going to do? There's only one thing you can do. Let me give you uh, what uh, former chairman Ben Bernanke said. He said, I have been studying this since the 30s. I mean, inflation and debt since the Great Depression. And I am convinced that the government has a technology called the printing press. And it can create as many dollars as we need to without any cost. And when you create the world with more dollars, what happens? Then the value of the dollar goes down. And then you eventually long-term have, long, have inflation. So it has worked since 2009. We've been able to keep the inflation down, even though we have a lot of quantitative easing. But there's a catch-up period, and it's coming. Definitely. It looks like there is a... Uh, a definite potential out there for some form of, of correction coming, uh, whether it be a full-blown crisis, crash, or slimmer, uh, calling it a, a correction here. Uh, it looks like definitely some agreement out here uh, in the chat as well as far as that being a, a potential here in the future. Well, in fairness to people, I would say that people have predicting this for the last four or five years. And so they've been wrong so far, but that doesn't mean that it isn't going to eventually happen. I would say the best advice you can do is to really study. You don't have to study much. You have to study the history of inflation. It's very easy to do. And uh, we have a lot of material on that I've been studying for. I gave a lecture on the history of inflation and so forth uh, 40 years ago. And it's the same thing with any society. You take gold all the way back to the Romans. What did the Romans do? They used to have a gold coin, then they reduced it, then it became a silver coin, 
then it became a copper coin, and then it became worthless, and that was the end of their civilization. So the secret of the, this country to preserve the great country that this is, and I'm going to tell you that most Americans don't appreciate how great this country is. You almost have to come from another society and see what a blessing this country is. And to be able to see them literally destroy this thing with the policies that we have in force is kind of sad. So I've come to the conclusion that I can't do anything to prevent the country from doing the way it is, but I can take the knowledge to make money on this foolishness and make money on it and help people preserve their capital and make money and take advantage of it because that's all you can do. So get your head down, start studying the things. There's plenty of information out there. There's a lot of people who are knowledgeable. They can help you and just go simple and easy and don't take big risks at this time. Understood. And continuing on down our list here, looks like we have another question coming in from Richard. Uh, he is asking, as a result of your analysis, would investing in mining stocks at this point in time be worthwhile? I would say that most of the time investing in mining stock is a losing proposition. I'm the first to admit that they're poor investment, they're usually highly leveraged, high capital expenditures, not necessarily great management teams on top of that. So you've got the worst and they're cyclical on top of that. So obviously this is not a Buffett type industry. On the other hand, there are times, unusual times, where the companies have done so poorly for 10 years, they've got their costs down, they've paid down their debt, they don't borrow money anymore, and the shareholders have forced them to quit buying back stocks that have done nothing but go down and pay dividends like Pioneer. So all of these mining companies are very aware that the investors are not going to be investing in them unless they prove that they're good stewards. And so the companies are developing variable dividends. This is a new thing and it's a wonderful thing because it prevents them from buying stock and overvalued, doing stupid acquisition and just force them to give the profits of the company to the shareholders. Now, this is not going to be good for the long term because if they don't invest in exploration and production, then the shortages are going to come out. But for the next five or six years, I think if you're very careful, and we have found some very good, knowledgeable management who are low cost producers, good balance sheets, great opportunities. And for those, a small percentage of your money could easily be invested with, I believe, good results. Absolutely. And now let me just state one thing in full disclosure. We are a big proponent of the oil, oil our fossil fuel industry, contrary to the rest of the world and most man, money managers and everything else. And we have been wrong. We got in early in 2016. We took a big hit to our portfolios and our client. We suffered a lot, but we believed that the way the world was going, there was no way that the oil business energy wasn't going to go up. And we hung in there, and we hung in there under trying conditions, about as difficult as it was when I first got into business, seven core bear market. But it's paying off now, and it's just started, and a company like Pioneer would be difficult to make a mistake in as long as you bought it with an assumption that you take at least a 6% dividend, figure out where the price to do it in, start today and you can average in, and there's many companies like that, and then you'll stay the course, and you'll be paid off in big time. Definitely. And continuing on down our list, uh, looks like WK, one of our regular viewers here, uh, is asking us to dive into the topic of SPACs, uh, the special purpose acquisition companies. Uh, he was asking uh, what your thoughts there on those, uh, especially looking at uh, what I believe is Pershing Square, uh, Taunting Holdings there. Um, just wanted to get some of your ideas there on, on SPACs and some of the, the craziness we've seen around those recently. Well, I think the right word is what you just used. There probably are some good ones with good money managers. They're the exception, and I would be very careful. 
I am really not that knowledgeable about all the ones out there. So I don't think that this is something that I would recommend unless I knew the money manager and knew the situation, really understood it. Just to buy a blank, you're, you're just buying speculation. It's kind of like Bitcoin. People ask me, what do you think about Bitcoin? I said, I don't think about it because I don't understand it. And if I don't understand it, it's not wrong to say, I'm sorry, I can't do this. You know, it's like if I was a doctor and I was a GP and say, how would you like to do a surgery this week? Well, if it's not your thing, you just don't do it. So I do I think that there's a potential for Bitcoin? I do. But right now, with what I understand about it, I think you would be better served by by things that you can analyze that you could say this is the true value. I don't know of anybody who's convinced me that they're a great value. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm not the one who would you. Definitely. So for those of you out in the audience, sounds like the, uh, the general sense here is uh, be cautious. Don't get too crazy out there. Looking down our list, looks like we have another question here. Uh, one of our regular questions that we do like to ask here, if we don't cover it specifically in any of our presentations, um, I believe the name's Dale. Uh, Dale, I'm sorry if I've said your name uh, wrong multiple times now, uh, but that's what I'm going with. Uh, Arnold, he's asking if you could tell us about your sell strategy. What makes you sell a stock? Why sell at any point in time? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, it is really a great question because in 50 years of studying different ways and doing different routines and so on and so forth, I couldn't say that I have a very great formula to say this is the way you do it. But I would say this, and we're in, we're in a heated debate among our analyst team in one particular company. So here's the way you look at it. You analyze the company, you put a value on it, and you decide this is the reason we bought it, and this is the reason the company's going to grow and prosper and so on and so forth. And then you put a value on that. Now, the time to sell is when something major changes that would suggest that what you project from the company is not going to happen. So you adjust your numbers, you move your numbers down. And let, let me just give you a quick example, which everybody's going to be forced to in the next five years. Everybody is, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of analysts are basing their multiples based on the one and a half percent interest rates, okay? Now, to me, that is stretching the thing unless you believe the one and a half percent is into perpetuity, which I don't think anybody does. So let's just say that it's one and a half percent. We would say over the next year and year and a half, we're going to use three to four percent interest rates because eventually it'll get there. We don't know. It can, like I showed you in a year, it can change. So now we have a lower opinion of that stock, which means we would sell it early. Now, if we see that inflation is moving higher than the three to four percent, and we think it's going to be five or six percent, I'm not suggesting, I'm just giving an example, then we would lower our sell point based on the valuation instead of three to four, or instead of one and a half, it might be five percent. And we would sell at the level that we think it's going to go to. If we felt that the inflation and interest rates would be temporary, uh, the inflation temporary, the multiple would stay higher. So the time to sell is not necessarily when you have a big gain. The time to sell is when the thesis change or the fundamentals change. Maybe the company has made an acquisition. And by the way, one of the real simple ways to sell is most acquisitions, and I kept them for the first 20 years, unfortunately, I lost my file. It wasn't on a computer and so forth and so on. But I kept statistics on acquisitions. And I came to the conclusion, I took every industry and said, retailers sell for this multiple, manufacturing for this, technology this and this and this. Now, what I found out, I used to subscribe to a service which is no longer, it was uh, regularly uh, no, I forgot the name of it but 20 years ago. But basically, they studied acquisition. They put them in the category and told them the multiple. Well, what was interesting, at the top of the market was 25 times earnings. 
At the bottom of the market, it was 13.7 times earnings. So you have a range that even among professional, it changes as things change. So what you do is you look at the situation and you say, all of a sudden, there's a statement that, well, we lost some business and we have a temporary cost and boom, 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 all the boba mice, excuse me for the word, but it means grandfather, grandmother's tables. Uh, you have the management come out and say, well, this is temporary, but we're going to go back up and so forth. You got to ask yourself, do you really believe it? Because when things change, the multiples and everything. So the answer, the short answer is you sell when the company has met your objective or the economic condition changed you to lower it or the thesis why you bought it changed. And I would, I would say the most important thing is to make sure that this company still is going to do what you expect it to do. And then to be disciplined. And if you have any doubt, you sell a little bit. You know, you can average out of it. But selling is a discipline. And by the way, I gave a talk, a podcast not too long ago. And what I wanted to point out to people, if you really want to understand the discipline, you study Benjamin Graham. Even though Warren Buffett is the major guru today who has his foundation in Benjamin Graham, he says he's 40% Graham and 60% Phil Fisher and so on and so forth. There, I have about 14 quotes from Benjamin Graham that talk nothing about discipline. He talks about the need to be able to think independently, the need to be able to stick to discipline, and the need to be able to develop your character so that you can always see the truth. So there's a big portion of being disciplined that comes with the idea that you practice character. And he, out of 35 or 40 quotes, I think 16 of them were just about character. So you have to become disciplined. If you're not disciplined in the way you eat, if you're not disciplined in the way you keep your health, if you're not disciplined in different things, it's going to be hard for you to be disciplined in self. And so I would say studying discipline. And by the way, uh, we didn't have time to talk about my background and the lessons from the Holocaust, but you mentioned that we wouldn't have time, but Anybody who wants to go in and listen to that, we've got a half an hour program talks about 16 lessons from the Holocaust. They're wonderful to be able to apply to your life because being successful as a person translates into being successful as an investor. The two go hand in hand. Absolutely. And for those of you out there, please do go check out some of that other content from Arnold that's out there around the internet. Uh, lots of great, interesting stories. I've luckily had the pleasure of listening to him myself over the phone. Uh, but th for those of you interested in hearing more about Arnold, please do go check those out. Tons of great information there. Uh, we do have a couple more questions here, Arnold. Uh, more than a couple, actually, I should say. Uh, we likely won't have time to quite hit every single one of them, but we'll go ahead and continue on down our list now. Question from Michael asking, uh, at this point in time, is it too late to, to get into some of these energy companies with them going up a lot lately, or is there still, uh, is there still opportunities out there to be had? Yeah, I would like to refer you to the uh, pioneer study because that'll give you, uh, could you put up the pioneer chart? Uh, l let me answer the question by using pioneer because it's a great example and it'll actually give him some value here. So let's pull up the pioneer chart. Okay, here we are. So the question is, is it too late to get in? Well, when oil was $35 a barrel, you can see if you wanted a 6% yield. And the reason we picked a 6% yield, because most oil companies, when they really get depressed, give you at least that much yield. So you want to at least get the maximum yield because oil companies are riskier and so on and so forth. So at $35, you, you would pay $75 for it. The stock is 193 today, so obviously it's not as good of an investment at $35. At 40, it would be 115. At 45, it would be worth 154. So $45 oil is very reasonable because the cost for most companies is $40. So you know the price is eventually going to be higher. 
So you can see that at this level, you're discounting $50 oil. Well, if you only thought that oil was going to go to $50, you would not want to buy the stock unless you were happy with just a 6% yield. However, oil is at $75, which would mean the stock would be worth 388 or 349 or 310. So it would give you a 6% yield plus the appreciation to these levels, which would be very attractive with a great balance sheet, lowest cost producers, great management team, and tier one acreage, which is the best acreage you could have. So it's not as great as it was, but it still has an opportunity. And let me just give you our personal feeling. And this has not been a new feeling. We've been pounding the table for the last couple of years, believing that there's going to be an oil shortage and the price of oil, which many individual brokerage houses and other people are referring to is going to go at least to $100. Now, that's not our prediction. We believe that at 70 to $75, it's still a great value. And when you think about the fact that the world energy is 83%, and that if we have to go from fossil fuel to renewables, which is only 5%, you can see that's going to be quite a while that we're going to need fossil fuel. So to answer your question directly, it's not the best time, but it's still, to me, we're in the third inning of the major bull market, and we think oil at the right price, remember, at the right price. So if you were in today, you could average in at 93, start with maybe one third of the position you're gonna buy, wait until it fluctuates between 154 and 193. $45 oil is certainly a reasonable assumption, especially if you're getting 6% yield and you can afford to wait. So when you buy the premier companies that still have the potential to double and go much higher, I don't think it's too late to get into the fossil fuel business. Now, remember this, you're gonna be criticized. It's totally negative. It's not ESG and all the other bubomices. But the point is we don't care about any of those things except that we're buying value and we can get a great return. And therefore it's not too late, but you gotta be careful and you gotta be disciplined. Understood. So if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, if you can take the heat from those around you, there's definitely some value there to be had. Absolutely. Well, Michael, there you go. Good answer for you there. Uh, lots of opportunity out there still available. Looking down our list here, Arnold, I'll go ahead and toss one more question out here at you that we'll, we'll go ahead and, and end things off on here. Uh, big overarching topic. Uh, we briefly hit on it looking at uh, that chart showing us where those commodities are coming from or from around the world. Uh, looking to another newsworthy topic here, looking at opportunities in China. Is this a consideration for you? Are you, are you looking there or are you keeping yourself at a 10-foot distance from those Chinese stocks? I would say that anybody who wanted to take the risk of investing in China, I am sure that there are great values, especially lately. And, you know, there's no getting around it that China, with all its problems, has a great future, unless something happens, of course. The, the risk is that government isn't exactly, I mean, you can see what they've done to even their own companies and their leaders. So there is a bigger risk in China. I would, my personal feeling is I would not invest in it, not because there isn't great opportunities. I feel there are great opportunities uh, with even less risk in some of the areas we're working for. So I'm not looking to expand into China. I would not be critical of anybody. I would say there's opportunity and maybe a certain percentage of the portfolio would be worth going into. Let's face it, they are going to be the beneficiary of a commodity bull market because they are dominant in commodities and they control the price. Look what's happening to aluminum. So there's lots of opportunities. The problem is, can you trust their accounting? Can you trust the, you know, the management, et cetera? Uh, that's something I don't want to get into, but there's opportunity. Definitely. Potential for money to be made. 
not necessarily the safest money out there, though. Well, Arnold, that is going to round out our time for questions today. Uh, for those of you out in the audience, there will be a full recap here on YouTube and on Guru Focus. If you missed anything, you will be able to go back, take a peek at it, travel through this journey once again. Uh, for those of you out there in the audience, we do appreciate you showing up. Please do take a moment to go ahead, like the video, comment your favorite parts here in a moment once we publish it. Feel free to comment any additional questions as well. We'd be happy to go ahead and pass those on to Arnold. You can obviously reach out to him directly at Century Management as well. Uh, if you are new here to the channel, please do take a moment, click that subscribe button, tune back in for future content. We really do appreciate it. Uh, as far as things go here, Arnold, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to go through that presentation, and thank you so much for answering these questions from our audience. They're very appreciative of you coming out and taking the time with us today. Well, thank you, Graham. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. And for everybody out there and yourself as well, Arnold, we wish you all the best, and we hope you get some strong returns on your investments moving out there into the future. That'll be it for us today, so we, all, we wish you all the best and hope you have a good day.